after an unexpected break, I am back. Uh, sorry, I've been a little bit MIA for the last couple of weeks. I injured my back and I was completely out of commission for about a week. And then following that, I had to get ready and go to the Keepers of the Old Ways, which is what you guys are about to see. I just wanted to do just a little bit of an intro to it. It was a little bit windy that day, so at parts throughout the video, there is some wind noise, but it doesn't last for very long, so hang in there. Hopefully you'll be able to get a little bit of a view of what it was like to be in the class. In today's presentation, I was showing how to make brine fermentation. It was the first time, I believe in my entire life, that I've ever done any sort of presentation. I think I even managed to skip out on it throughout high school, but I hope that you guys enjoy. I am Anna. I have a YouTube channel called The Fermented Home Said. I don't know if you guys know of it, but I make all kinds of stuff. Uh, food preservation in all of its forms. Fermenting, canning, uh, freezing, dehydrating. Not freeze drying yet, but maybe someday. We'll see. Um, but I, through the challenges of my history and my, my health issues, I was obsessed with gut health and realizing that's kind of the key to a lot of different things. So that's just a big part of my focus is uh, that's where the fermentation came in. I just really enjoyed the taste of sauerkraut and pickles. But the thing that most people aren't told, aren't aware of, is that it kills the good and the bad. And if you leave things in like just this, I mean, within reason, this natural world, it's the good almost always, if it's given the right conditions, will overcome and take over the bad stuff. So like that's what fermentation is. We're giving it the perfect environment for all the good stuff to survive and to kind of take over. And we, it turns the, when you, okay, when you, put the water into the jar, you cover everything up, and you submerge it underneath the water, it becomes an airless environment, which the good bacteria enjoy, and then you add the salt in there, the bad bacteria can't survive in the salt in the salty environment, and so you're just creating this perfect environment for the good guys to take over before the bad guys have a chance to get caught up, and so they just can't do anything, like it's just, it becomes like the perfect environment. And I know that food safety is often something that a lot of people who haven't fermented before are very concerned with. They, they're they like, I'm gonna get botulism. Like that's the number one thing I hear. It's either I tried fermenting and my pickles sucked, it's always pickles, or I'm gonna get botulism. Okay, so I did research, like, you know, I do YouTube videos and I try and make sure that I know what the heck I'm talking about at least some of the time before I say it. So like, I did went to the CDC website, I looked it up, there have been two cases in recorded history the CDC keeps of somebody getting botulism from a fermented food. And 
and it was from an improperly made kimchi, which has like the fish paste and, and the, the other stuff in there. So it's most likely not done well. But that was back in 2011. There's not been a single reported case of it since. So I really hope that that helps because the, the environment within a properly fermented jar is exactly what botulism cannot survive in. And that's another thing with the fermentation is that it drops the acidity level. Um, if, if you guys don't know, the acidity, there's a scale. It goes, runs from zero, which is like the most like metal melting acid on the existence of the earth, which is zero. And it goes up to 14. And that's completely alkaline. I don't have a complete working knowledge of what the heck alkaline is, but I just know it's the scale, right? And seven is in the middle, neutral. It's what most proper water is, you know, like there's debate on that, but whatever. Seven is right smack dab in the middle. It's not acidic and it's not alkaline. When you go below 4.6, so from zero to 4.6, well, if you want to call it 4.5, because probably you're below 4.6, the botulism, E. coli, salmonella, H. pylori, C. diff, all of those cannot survive inside of that jar. So if you get it below that level, it's literally impossible. So I hope that that kind of helps to assuage some of the fears as far as, as fermenting goes. There, there's a lot of other things canning in particular that has a little bit more likelihood to cause those sorts of things when it's improperly done. I don't want fear to scare you away from, can from canning because it's a wonderful thing. But fermentation, you're preserving food with life instead of death. So it's like it has everything in it it needs. If something happened to get in there, it's just going to kill it off. So you're good, right? So uh, let me see, where am I next here? Any questions about food safety? Any concerns? I should say one last note on, on the food safety is when you're fermenting, you really don't want to use anything that is like a chemical antibacterial anything because they like bleach or like Lysol, things like that. You really don't want to use that on your fermenting tools, your jars, obviously certainly not the food. Um, you can, it leaves behind a film, like even if you rinse it off really, really well, it can leave behind a film that left behind that can, uh, it can really either drastically slow down your ferment or it can just make it to go super wonky and it gets funky. So try and avoid those if you if you have the opportunity to buy things that aren't antibacterial, like chemical, you know? So uh, just one more note on that one. <clears throat> okay, so to, I'm doing two talks. One today, we're gonna be doing something called brine fermentation. And that is something like pickles or fermented carrots. Uh, I have some red onion here and cauliflower, I forgot the name for a second there. So we're gonna be doing four different ferments. I'm probably gonna, maybe if somebody wants to come up here, throw on a pair of gloves and help me chop so I can talk at some point, that would be awesome. Uh, but then if you guys are gonna be back here tomorrow, we're gonna work on sauerkraut. That's a little bit of a different technique. All, a lot of the safety things, it all still applies. It's just a different technique where you actually apply the salt directly to the cabbage and then you kind of massage it in a little bit and then leave it to set for a while and it then just starts to release all the water from within it and that that process a lot of people like they just beat it with like for like 10 minutes and i'm like you don't need to do that you just literally massage it in enough to where you start to see it leap basically and then you cover it with a towel and walk away and then you come back whenever the heck you have the opportunity within maybe like four hours or so and you pack it in the jar and it's got tons of brine and it's fantastic it, it creates its own brine but when you're fermenting things like carrots uh, cucumbers, things like that, you pour the brine on top of it instead of pulling it out. And as with some things, like I make a cucumber kimchi with, with uh, the cucumbers, and you can extract a lot of the brine from it. it. There are ways to do it, but there's just two different ways to do it, so I figured I'd show you two different days, right? So, um, let me see here. What is... And... Okay, so you had talked about mold earlier and having mold on your stuff during the safety events. So that's one thing that a lot of people also can get kind of afraid of. There's there's many different types of molds, but not everything that grows is mold. There's something called calm yeast. It, I don't know how to spell it. It's K-A-H-M or K-H-A-M. I never remember how to spell it. And that is going to be, it's, a, it's like a film. It almost looks a little bit oily, a little bit chalky on top, and it's not furry. And that is, while not necessarily appealing, you can scrape it right off, 
with zero issues. It is non-toxic completely. But if you do leave it to grow, it can kind of overtake the flavor of the jar. It'll get kind of funky and it's just not appealing at that point. But you can still eat it and you wouldn't die. I mean, you could eat any of it and you'd probably not die. But And then um, there's white mold that can grow. Um, that one is generally pretty safe to scrape off. Again, just to geek with Google, y'all do your own research. But I will almost always scrape off anything that is a white mold. I don't care. Um, it's not really anything in the fermenting world that is dangerous, so I don't worry about it. Green. If it's like the tiniest little itiest bitty fleck, like it just looks like a little piece of like, you know, oregano or something, I might scrape it off, but I might also toss it. Any other color is an instant pass. You got black mold, pink mold, purple, blue, whatever color of the rainbow you choose, it's a hard pass for me. Um, when you're fermenting things that have color, beets, um, sometimes carrots depending, but like some of the darker colored carrots especially, like they can change the color of the mold. So you just have to kind of use your own judgment on that one. Um, but generally speaking, if it's not white, I chuck it. Um, and you can tell the difference between calm yeast and mold by the fur. If it's furry, do what you wish. If you have a mold sensitivity, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with it, you know. Uh, but I don't have a mold sensitivity and I don't have any issues with it. I've done it for as long as I fermented and never had an issue. I'm still standing here. Um, but any other color, highly encourage people to just, just pass it. Just, just feed it to the chickens. The dogs might like it. They're probably not going to have anything to do with it, but you never know. <laughs> so, um, and I've also seen, like, I do a lot of, I watch a lot of videos on this, on the topic. I do a lot of research. I see, you know, videos, all sorts of things. And like there's old school people like they will literally have like a 55 gallon barrel of sauerkraut fermenting in the, their basement and like their protection is a giant sheet of mold they just let it grow I, i've never done that i can't say i will ever get the courage to do that i don't recommend anybody do it but i'm just saying like it's not something that is that you have to fear like it's just something that you have to learn to work with and learn the, the conditions and the um, and the skills and everything to be able to do it. So, um, proceed at your own risk, but just don't be careful. It's all good. This is just nature's way of preserving food, you know? So, um, does anybody know why they want to ferment? Like, why is it, what's the curiosity behind it for people? It's healthy. It's healthy, gut health. Long-term preservation. Long-term preservation. For animal feed. Animal feed, absolutely. I love ferment my animal feed. It makes it last so much longer. Or it goes much further. You can feed them less. Definitely. And um, so the reason that that it's so good for your health, we kind of covered briefly earlier, but it's the it's the microbes in there. It's the bacteria. It's the if anybody sitting in the sun wants to move into the shade, feel free. Y'all seem like you're kind of hot. I'm just like we were out here yesterday and this was all shaded so i don't know what's going on it was the exact almost the exact same time but feel free y'all please if we do have to head in or over there maybe it's a little bit shadier i'm perfectly willing to move this was just where the tent was so we came fermenting your food helps with gut health um, if, um the main one is obviously the bacteria uh, does anybody in here anybody in here not know that bacteria is actually what digests most of the food that you consume it's not your physical body isn't that crazy like you just have like a giant colony in there with like trillions and trillions of bacteria that just munch away on your food and they turn it into something that your body can actually use so if you if you're deficient if you're doing antibiotics a lot of medicines a lot of you know just you know poor whatever um you can really damage your gut microbiome that's what happened to me i you know it didn't look the greatest life and you know it, it caught up to me and so i'm trying to fix it and so gut health is one of the main ways that i'm able to, to kind of get that get there and be able to achieve that and then another reason that it's great also digestively is that it breaks down the food that you eat um, i have something that's called SIBO it's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and it causes me to not be able to eat a lot of grains beans a lot of different vegetables and um, fermenting it breaks down a lot of the things that are very gut challenging for me personally and a lot of people it makes it so that it can just it, it just it, it doesn't it doesn't cause a lot of the side effects that you would get any other way so when you ferment it it just it turns it into something just just epic food it almost turns it into medicine you know like vegetables are great on their own but when you ferment them it like 100 x is all of the power behind it and another benefit is it preserves it you know and 
The great thing about it is it preserves it with something called lactic acid, and that's what's produced from the, the bacteria. There's a lot. A, 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 there's an epic amount of bacteria that are on these these vegetables here. So, like when we're fermenting carrots, we don't peel them. I don't even peel them, even if they're not organic. These happen to be organic because that's what they had at Walmart. But you don't peel them because that is where all of the bacteria are. If you peel them off, you still have some left behind, you know, because you got your peeler and you're still touching it. Like there's still some bacteria there. So if you're really skeeved out, you can, you can do it. You can peel it. You can roll one in. It's going to just take a little bit longer and not be quite as active. You know, it'll just take a little while to catch up. Um, things like these got bacteria on there. You know, all of these things have bacteria on them and a mixture of good and bad, which is why we put it in the environment that is perfect for the good. And then the bad can't survive. Win win. And the lactic acid is what preserves it for long term. It lowers the pH to a point that we can actually, um, it can be preserved. And it's it's safe in cold storage. We ferment it. We're going to take these vegetables, we're going to ferment them, we're going to put them in the brine, and then they will ferment, rather. And that fermentation process is going to produce the lactic acid, and that's what preserves the food. Right? So, um, I think we're probably ready to go ahead and start chopping up some of the ingredients so I can actually show you what I'm talking about. Before I talk to you guys, the off, I do that a lot. Um, is there anybody out here who wants to chop up some vegetables? You want to come chop some vegetables? <laughs> I got a nice pretty turquoise knife. I bought it at Walmart yesterday. Sweet. I got some gloves here for you. Just so that we everybody feels perfectly safe to... Oh, sorry. Everybody feels safe to take home one of these with them if they would like to. You want to just cut up the pickles however you like, I I've guess. I've heard that the, uh, the ships that shipped over from Europe to America, uh -huh. they use this process to preserve mm -hmm. their food. Yep, and that's how they were able to, to avoid scurvy. A, a, lot of, a lot of ships, uh, a lot of their crew would die from scurvy because they, by the end of the ship, by the end of the trip, or like halfway through the trip, they'd gone through all of their fresh vegetables, they were out of vitamin C, I don't know if they knew what caused the scurvy or, or not, but I think my understanding is they had kind of had come across it by accident. The food had just it happened to happen to ferment, and it was long before that, obviously. But they had just realized that when they ate the sauerkraut, the fermented vegetables, they didn't die. So that was kind of their secret secret weapon, basically. Um, my understanding is it actually came about in China when they were building the Great Wall of China. That was kind of where intentional fermentation really came across. I'm not saying I know it. I wasn't there, so uh, but that's my that's my I know, right? <laughs> well, good for like however long ago that thing was built. Perfect. Nope, that's perfect. they get populated enough, 
that there's all different kinds of things that are just going to take over in that jar. So, um, not yet. We'll see how many jars we have. <laughs> so, you want to pack these in there and I can chop you through it? Awesome. So, just load them in there as tightly as you can kind of get. Don't squish them in there, but kind of shimmy and shake it. Move it all around and then it'll get it to settle within all the pockets. When we're loading it in these jars, you can use any vessel that you want to except certain types of metal. You don't want to use aluminum and the reason for that is the once the acidity drops it will leach out the aluminum from it and it turns it into something very very dangerous and toxic. Um, I forgot to mention you want to leave about an inch and a half of headspace um, and that is because this stuff this one maybe not so much because it has a lot of air gaps but when it is creating the lactic acid before the lactic acid really gets pumping. That's like about the two week mark that it really starts to really amp up the lactic acid. But during the stage right before that, it creates something called uh, CO2. And it creates a bunch of bubbles inside of there. And if you're doing something like this, you can kind of see it has lots of air bubbles, lots of gaps. So just a little tap on it usually will release those bubbles and it won't start to push the vegetables up. But if you're doing like sauerkraut or packing anything in there super tightly, it is going to create bubbles and it will start to push everything out, whether that's the brine or in some cases, it can even start to push the vegetables out of the jar, which doesn't make it bad. It just makes it, um, you just don't want to. Then you're gonna have a dry ferment, number one. And number two, you might you know, break the seal, the stuff will start to get moldy. You know, you're, just, you're trying to avoid the mold, but if you get it, no, it's not the end of the world. So with this, Julie, I forgot water. Okay. Well, I rinse them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I mean, I rinse them. Not, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, like, I just always wash them. Do I have to? No. I, I don't. Okay. Well, I'm not I going to anymore. <laughs> I rinse them. I'm not going to wash them things. Well, one thing, it, it kind of just depends. I know that I've, I've heard some people say that you just want to be careful because you don't know what's in the factory well, kind of thing. You know, you don't know what kind of the byproducts are. And that's why I rinse them. But, I always just wash them slightly with soap, but I'm like, dang, if I don't have to waste that time washing all them jars. Yeah, I mean, it, I should say most of the time I don't use uh, brand new jars. Like I, I have a pretty good stash of them, but if I do use the new jars, um, it kind of just depends on what I'm doing. I, should, I shouldn't say that I never wash them. Like um, like all the ferments that I made uh, up there, I took them all out, I ran them through the sanitizing cycle, and I, and I boiled them. You know, I didn't use any sanitizer solution, but you know, I made sure that they were clean. And one way that you can do that without using any kind of antibacterial stuff, you just boil them for, for, for 20 minutes and they're completely sterilized. And you don't have to worry about it, you don't have any of the byproducts, they're, you know, they're clean going into the pot. You know, you, you wash them with whatever you need to, um, and then you boil them and you're, you're totally good to go. Awesome, love it. So the cool thing about fermenting is you can create whatever flavors that you want to. So we got a little bit of space in that, in that one there, right? So we can top it off with some carrots and then you have a mixture and you just never know what you're gonna come up with. Like, I don't think I've ever made a ferment that I was just like, it was nasty. Like, unless it went bad, of course. Yeah. But like any flavor combination you can think of and, and you're like, I bet that would be good or I wonder if that would be good. The nice thing is, is that this jar right here completely filled up with vegetables was probably, I don't know, $2 and you can get it cheaper, especially if you garden, it's free, you know? And so you have the freedom to experiment don't like it give it to your neighbor be like hey do you like this <laughs> whatever you want to do with it you can do you can do anything with it. so what we're gonna do is we got a question oh I'm so sorry yes um, so do you use cow protein because that has I, I have well water I don't think about these things <laughs> normally you don't normally you don't so these might have to be sacrificed jars so um, I have I well water, I just never even think about it, and I don't really go anywhere that has um, non-well water. So that is an excellent point, and you do want to make sure that you're using uh, filtered water. You can boil the water if you'd like to, and that will get rid of the chlorine. You just boil it for a couple minutes with the lid off, and just let all the stuff evaporate. Um, but filtered water is definitely ideal, something that is rated to get rid of the, the chlorine in it. And then if you have fluoride in your water, sorry for but um, boiling doesn't do anything for that. But filtering does, you can get reverse osmosis water. Um, you can use distilled water, but that tends to leach a lot of the minerals um, out, of, out of things. So, you, you know, but 
if that if that's what you all you have access to, that's totally fine. Just whatever thing that you have, bleach is the number one thing because it's it's it's, it's chemical. So I'm glad you reminded me of that. So we're just gonna, these might just be sacrifice jars. Anybody who's willing to take them home, they're not going to be toxic by any means. I mean, if you drink tap water and if you live in the city and you, you do that anyways, you know, there's probably nothing wrong with it. It will still ferment. It's just going to take a little bit longer. And there's a slight chance that, a slight more chance that it could go sour. Or not sour, sour. It could go bad. But, um, so at any rate, the proper way that you add the salts to the jars, right? You weigh these ingredients and you do 2% ratio. So I like to make my math and my life a lot easier by weighing in grams, right? So normally we're gonna take this jar right here, see? Put it on a flat surface, take the fermenting vessel, oh, that echoed, take the fermenting vessel that you're gonna use. And you tear the scale. So it's, a, so everybody, I'm sure everybody knows what a tear is. And then you take the other one, put it on there. This has 255 grams of vegetables in here, right? So that means that we need 2.5 grams of salt. You just move the decimal over two points. So we need 2.5 grams is, is 1% and just double it. So we got five grams of salt that needs to go into this jar. If I'm throwing too much information at you guys, let me know. I don't want to confuse or overwhelm anybody. I'm fully open to questions and I want to make sure that you guys walk out of here feeling that you can ferment. And like I said, this is my first time doing any kind of live speech. So is the salt barely... just for the taste? No, it is for food it's preservation. For the yes. Okay. Uh, the salt works to preserve it, number one, by um, giving it the environment that the good bacteria needs. And it also preserves the pectins inside of here. If you ferment this, or if you are able to successfully get it to ferment without um, without salt in there, it's going to be mushy. It's going to be gross, and you may not want to eat it. It might even get slimy. So it is very important. Um, the general for vegetable fermentation, like I said, is a two percent ratio. And a lot of people also weigh the water with it. Um, so that is that is the technical way of doing it. The way that I usually do it is I take a pint jar, I fill it an empty pint jar, let's do that proper demonstration, an empty pint sized jar and I add one tablespoon of salt. And when you add that to the vegetables and it, it, it takes up the space in there, that almost every single time gives it a one percent or two percent ratio of salt. And that is the easy way to bypass it. You don't need a scale, which I have, um, but I but you do need a tablespoon measurement, which I don't have, so we're gonna wait today. So, <coughs> all right, so now we're going to hit the tear button again. So now it's zeroed out and we're going to add in five tablespoons grams of salt. Kind of salt are you using? Uh, I'm using pink Himalayan salt. You can use any salt that you want to, up to and with conditions including iodized table salt. Uh, but I don't recommend using iodized table salt because it, it doesn't eat, it doesn't have the correct saline content and it's just toxic. Um, sea salt Sea salt's great. And it's not the iodine that makes it toxic, it's the other stuff in there. The iodine is just antimicrobial. So it's, you know, it's like I said, it's the same thing with, with the, um, the chlorine in the water. I just was shaking it up to make sure that this all got mixed in. That's all I was really 
do in there. Um, I usually mix this though. I usually mix the brine separate, but we're doing things a little different today, apparently. And one, there are a lot of different tools that you can use when you are fermenting. I'm just trying to jam it. I'm already going to touch it. It'll work. Um, there are a lot of different tools that you can use. My personal favorite is a kit called Mason Tops. And that is just, it's just, it's a weight that holds stuff under. And you can, and it has a top on there. And all this, I don't want to overwhelm you by explaining stuff before I show it to you. But all you actually need is a lid. And just make sure everything's held under. If you have sour, if, sorry, if you have cabbage, you cut out a little ring. Actually, I have some cabbage in my cooler. I can show you. I, I'm saving it for the cat for the um, sauerkraut for tomorrow. But... Remember, they've used a little bit more of the sulfury vegetables. It can alter the flavor a little bit. Cabbage, I find, doesn't alter the flavor at all. And an onion peel. Oftentimes, I use an onion peel because it just adds to the flavor and it's fantastic. I just cut the onion, you know, I'll just uh, like cut the onion this way. And then you have a nice little sheet of onion you can just use as a great topper and it, and it adds to the flavor too. So you just take the cabbage leaf here and you put it around everything inside of the jar. And that is one of the nice things about using the regular uh, mouth jars is you have this little shoulder that helps to keep 
everything under. I used to prefer uh, fermenting in the wide mouth jar, it's a little easier to get things in and out of it, but I also found it was harder to hold things under the brine unless you have the Mason Cox weight. Or, you know, there's generic brands too, that's just the one that I really enjoy using. So I just like to put three of them on there just for extra protection. You can absolutely get by with just one, if that's all you got. Don't even stress it. Um, there's one thing that you'll find about me is that I am just, I, I hate overthinking things. And sometimes it can get me in trouble, but um, oftentimes I find a lot of really cool stuff through it, you know, cause it's like I try to just be like, um, maybe it'll work. Find out. Um, that's all there is to it. So you have a permit. You just leave it at room temperature. Um, ideally, very ideally, a cooler room temperature. I like things between 65 to 70 degrees. You can go a little bit warmer, but you have to remember that every any bit warmer that you go over 70 will have an impact on the ferment in whatever way. It's not necessarily undesirable at that point, but when you ferment things in a warmer temperature, you're much more likely to get the calm yeast that we were talking about earlier. It really likes the heat. I find that um, carrots and or fruit ferments, anything that's a little bit sweeter and heat, and not ex excess heat, but just kind of a warmer room temperature, you're more likely to get that calm yeast to form. So if you do get the calm yeast, look at those two things. Is it a sweeter ferment? And what is my temperature that I'm fermenting at? Um, a lot of people um, like, they keep their house at a warmer temperature or it's the summer and you don't want to turn on the AC. Um, the, some great places to find cool little corners in your house are underneath your bed, underneath furniture, inside of cabinets, um, not the bathroom cabinet. God, please don't ever ferment in your bathroom. It will, it can pick up the, the stuff that's in your bathroom. So don't ferment, don't put your ferments in the bathroom. But you know, uh, all different kinds, you can put them like behind anything that might be shaded, cool. Um, you, you, if you're able to keep it out of the light, go for it. It's not the end of the world, but do not keep it in direct sunlight. Um, if you have it near a window, make sure you know where the window is going to shine. Um, you know, and if it's going to shine directly on it, I wouldn't put it there because it's going to be hot if you cover it. Um, but just keeping it at cool room temperature will preserve the pectins in there. It'll get a little bit soggy as well if you ferment it too warm of a temperature. Um, for, for I don't know what the reason is, but it just likes to ferment at a cooler temperature. It likes to ferment at a cooler temperature, and if you ferment too warm, the ferment will go very quickly, which means it will skip over a couple of steps in the fermentation process. And like I said, it won't necessarily automatically make it an undesirable product, but it's more likely that it wouldn't be undesirable. Um, for, for me personally, the, I like the cool temperatures simply because they taste better. It, it's just it's more delicious. It's crunchier and it has more, just a deep developed umami flavor. You know what I'm saying? Pretty good, I'll sit down. Oh cool, I'll get you help for the next one. So you don't have to burp or anything? Bump, uh, bump on top. When this thing, you can't push it down, open it and close it. Um, just be wary that if it is a supercharged ferment, you might have to do that really quickly and then close it, and then really quickly close it, just to let a little bit out. Uh, but if it's not a super active ferment, you can just open it and let, let it get all the, the sizzles out. But once you start to hear it, you, I mean, you'll get to know when, when the liquid's getting to the lid and then you can close it off. So when you're using this style lid, crank it. Just crank it. Just make sure that you're monitoring it. If you don't have the ability to monitor it, don't crank it on there. It, certain ferments can get very charged and they can, in theory, explode. I've never had that happen, ever, and I have absent-minded human being you'll likely to encounter today so you know like it's very forgiving <laughs> ferments are so forgiving it's not even funny um i really I, it makes me sad that it is so um like just feared and then so many people are just like i'm so scared to do it but it's like you just saw how simple that was i mean all it is at this point is just monitoring it and making sure check on it every few days um you'll start to notice the point that you need to really start to burp it you'll see the bubbles in there like you'll see it start to form especially if you're doing like sauerkraut or anything like that you will see the bubbles in there you'll see um like the gaps between the, the the cabbage leaves you'll see the co2 in there start to form and that's when you know okay i just gotta burp it and then we're good to go until you see that and that usually starts on around the two day mark i start looking you know I'll, like 48 hours later i kind of know 
Um, but usually lately it's been like one day. I don't know what it is about my new house, but like I, I made some permits like literally the day before we met, left, and I forgot to ask my husband to burp it. So I was like, I think it'll be fine. And he texted me, he was like, those lids are really bulging. <laughs> and I'm like, oh crap, can you, can you burp them? So like one day, it can take, you know, everything varies. It varies depending on the season, you know? And winter permits just go slow. There's not as much activity in the air. There's not as much bacteria. The, the vegetables generally aren't as fresh. Um, so there's a lot of different factors that go into it, and that might be part of what kind of scares people. Because they're like, well, sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't work. What if I do this? What if I do that? But it's like, what if it's what if it's what if it succeeds? What if it does great and you discover something amazing? And then if it sucks, you just didn't work. Wait, it sucks, but you know, you lost a few and stuff. It's not, you know, it's not awful, but you know. So um, I want to make sure. It's, um, it, it depends on your taste, honestly. Um, I personally uh, very much enjoy a very sour, uh, very acidic ferment. Um, and I know that not everybody prefers that. So like the stuff that I make for other people, I generally go about 10 days. And um, But I generally for myself, a month or two, sometimes three, it, it depends. Like especially sauerkraut, I go six months usually. Like I really like it nice. As soon as it gets to the flavor that you enjoy, um, you know, you want to taste it with like a, a clean, clean fork or something like that, you just dip it. Never double dip in the because then you're going to introduce your bacteria to it. But just grab a clean fork, taste it. If you like it, great. Throw it in the fridge. If you're like, no, that needs to be more acidic, do it on the counter. You know, or in your shelf or behind you, you know, in your bed, in your, in your closet, wherever you find this the right temperature, just put it back. Like, there's no... Yeah. I was just going to confirm. When, you, when you're satisfied with the flavor, the way that you stop the process is to put it in the fridge? The way you slow the process, yes. Okay, it so just we'll continue stop. to ferment in the fridge? Very, very slight levels. Um, the way that I like to look at, at fermenting as far as um, like the fermentation process is, is sort of like winemaking. Like where you make the wine, you create the alcohol through the process, right? And then you age it. You know, and like you can, it, it'll, the flavors will mature in the fridge and it will start continue to ferment at a very slow pace. Anything under, I can't remember off the top of my head, it's 50 or 55 degrees, whatever the <laughs> cellar is thing, I think it's 55 degrees. Um, that is the process that, that the basic, I don't, I don't want to say that the bacteria hibernate or go to sleep, but it really slows them down a lot. So if you put it in the fridge, it's like minuscule, but it's more like a developing that help? Awesome. So, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we're missing from the fermentation process here. You got one more question over here. Yes. A second ago you said there were three things. Airless, salty, and acidic. We create the airless and the salty and then the bacteria creates the acidic. Um, anybody else have any more questions just yet? Awesome. Okay. So, uh, I guess
<laughs> it's nice. Okay, so this one we're going to pour the water over. I just want to make sure you guys get a few ferments to take with you. Whomever would like to drink those are or bleach. Pardon? I think that should be good. <laughs>
Sorry? Detoxing and Yes, it's, it's a detox reaction for the most part because you just ingested this entire pint worth of probiotics, um, you know, healthy acids, all different sorts of things. So you're, it, it does what it's supposed to do. It goes after the bad stuff that's in your body and it gets it out and it goes to war. It's like a war inside of your gut and you feel it. So, but if you start slow and you just slowly start to just add it, like start like with the tablespoon with your meal and then amp it up, maybe add another tablespoon. So you do that, you know, just keep increasing it as you feel okay. And then you, your body eventually gets adjusted to it and you really start to create symptoms. Like you will honestly start to create symptoms. Like I haven't had bullshit in a month and I'm stressed about it. So I'm sure that, uh, but like I keep thinking, I was like, because I have kombucha that's been fermenting for like three months and every day I look at it and I'm like, I really need to ferment you, but I don't do it. And then I don't have kombucha. So um, you really, body really starts to love it and crave it. If you love pickles, you will love, or if you love any kind of pickle, acidic type flavors, you will automatically, I'm sure, love this stuff because it's, it's very similar. It's a less sweet taste, but it's very similar. Um, and if you don't like it, but you, you want the benefits that come along with it, you want the, you know, the things that it offers your digestive system, start out small. Include it, you know, add like a tablespoon of sauerkraut to your salad or your tacos or anything like that, which by the way, is so delicious. Tacos is not funny. Um, and then once your body gets used to it and adjusts to it, you're going to start to crave it. Like, I'm not even joking. Like, your gut controls all of your cravings. Almost all of them are completely controlled by the gut microbiome that you have. So if you start to eat good quality foods, you're going to start to crave good quality foods. If you start to eat the foods, like, because you have to remember that the stuff that is in here and on here, um, on the vegetable dishes, but that is what you did have issues with. It's got stuff. 
has almost every ferment you can possibly imagine on the face of the earth, and it's written by a normal human being. It's not written by a scientist. It is written by somebody, you know, like similar to me, just somebody who's passionate with some you know, health struggles and decided to discover fermentation and then be Super cool, chill guy. He's got a lot. He's, he doesn't. I don't think he has his own, much of his own YouTube stuff, but he does do like a lot of presentation type stuff. He does a lot of interviews, so you can find a wealth of information from him. It's fantastic. What time is it? I want anybody have to miss the divers because I don't want to miss the divers. Any more questions? Anybody who wants to go and hit up there and not miss the divers, I won't be offended. Yes.